Hey there guys, this video is a little bit different. This is a discussion that I had on a live stream with one of my friends, internationally acclaimed enrichment specialist Robin Shwokas Sullivan. She is one of the co-owners of the Leather Elves and an absolutely phenomenal mind when it comes to providing for a variety of animal species. Now this discussion was concerning better living through training essentially taking a look at some of the most useful behaviors when it comes to working with a brand new bird. Uh, the goal of this is to assess the behaviors that make keeping a bird easier. Uh, so if that is something you guys are interested in, if you have a new bird in your life, or you just think it's a worthwhile topic, you want to make sure to stick around because that's going to be coming up right up. <music> Hey everybody, and welcome to Friday Night Flock Talk with myself, Robin Sullivan from the Leather Elves, and Jack Pine from High Redbird. Hey Jack, how's it going? Hey Robin, I'm doing pretty good. I've got my coffee because I have baby birds. Um, they are hopefully not going to make themselves audibly known during this presentation. I do have them in the other room. And just like any parent with small children can tell you right now, I am just trying not to exist too loudly because otherwise they will know I am here and they will want something. Well, you know, if you have silent birds, I think there's a big market for that. I'm just saying, you know, I <laughs> a lot of people out there who are like, I want one of those. Um, so maybe we can help a little bit with some of that. Well, we're not going to talk about the silent part tonight, but, um, Jack and I were talking about how we could help you guys maybe with some training. And we titled tonight's uh, episode, if you will, um, Better Living Through Training. And there are some behaviors that Jack and I have talked about that will, I promise you, if you can get these behaviors down, they will make life easier. So, Jack, would you agree that sometimes the training piece just makes life go so much more smoothly? I, you know, I think a lot of people don't realize that a lot of what you do when you have an animal is going to fall under the heading of training. You know, when you have a certain routine that you do with your animals, if they are used to, you know, if you have a dog that is trained to go onto the sofa and wait there while you prep its dinner, you've trained three different behaviors right there, and that's going to make your life so much easier. Uh, I think so... We call it training and we're going to use a lot of, you know, technical terminology that might be a little intimidating to some people. But at the end of the day, it's about building a relationship with your animals and having that ability to communicate with them a little more effectively to make your life easier. Um, so I don't want people to be intimidated because there are so many things you probably already have a good handle on. Uh, and I also want people to recognize that, you know, we're, we like birds. We're going to talk about birds. We're going to show you photos of birds. We're going to have videos of birds. But a lot of these things are going to apply to a wide variety of animals. So even if you don't have birds, you could apply this to, uh, you know, your dog, your cat. Um, obviously, if we're talking about something like uh, a step up behavior with a bird, you probably don't want to try that with, you know, your Clydesdale. Um, may not work out so well, but a lot of these behaviors can be applied to different animals. Absolutely. And I think, you know, we do some inadvertent training too. You know, there are things that we don't even realize we're training and we reinforce things and we get behaviors that get set and it's a matter of, of by accident, you know, you just, okay, I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Oh yeah. Good. Oh, good job. And wait, uh oh, that's not the way it's supposed to go. Um, the internet. I was like, what's an intercollegiate stick, Adrian? Hold on. Is that one of those technical <laughs> terms Jack was talking about? 
Um, shaping and conditioning <laughs> doesn't happen, Julie. That's my point. I'm gonna let Julie do the podcast or the episode tonight, the live stream, because she put things so well. Um, so okay. So I think Jack mentioned the first one that we need to talk about, um, and that would be step up and step down. So we've got a little clip um, that we're gonna show you. Um, if Nick can make the magic happen. Now, a great behavior to start off when it comes to training your bird is going to be teaching them to step up. It does give you the opportunity to easily move your bird around. Uh, and for most birds, it's going to be a pretty simple process. Uh, it just goes with the cue, come here, step up. And you can see it goes pretty easily. Uh, now, one thing you do want to keep in mind when you teach a bird to step up, you are also going to want to teach them to step down. Good bird. Making sure that your bird knows how to get up and down from your hand is going to be important. Now, depending on what bird you're training, some of them are going to be more comfortable. Uh, instead of having the hand presented from in front, they may want the hand presented from behind. Grayson here likes to go in front. Um, and they may also want to step forward or step back to get off of your hand. Okay, so Jack makes it look super easy. And step up, step down is something that, you know, I think we all do need to train. There's, there, maybe it's not step up to your hand, maybe it's step up to a perch. Um, but at least it's something, it's a way to move your bird um, and comfortably and not, it's not a grab. So, Jack, when you talked about presenting in front or in back, why would you suggest that? So I have found that there are some birds who, you know, they might be a little grabby with their beak. They might be a little bit intimidated by hand. So having a hand presented right in front of them can be a little bit scary. Whereas if the hand's behind them and they just step back onto it, um, that works well for them. And sometimes, especially if you've gotten something like uh, a, re a rescue or a rehomed bird, you're going to have a bird that was already trained and conditioned for another behavior. And uh, one thing we do need to recognize when we are training our animals, there's always going to be a way that you can train around certain criteria. You can shape a behavior to be anything you want, but sometimes it's just easier to just roll with it. So if you have a bird that for the last 30 years has done a step up by moving back onto someone's hand, you're probably just easier and better off getting that bird to continue that behavior. Absolutely. And Melissa, you know, Melissa says Zorro learned back when he was a baby. And a lot of our birds, that's one of the first things that, you know, if you get them from a store, that's what the one of the first things they're going to teach them. Or it may be from a breeder, that may be the breeder's way of moving them around, step up, and they go. I can't, I mean, most birds have some form of step up in their repertoire. And I think it's important that your bird will kind of tell you too. So this is, Jack and I are always talking to you guys about observation and listening to your body, your bird's body language. And I think that's part of this. If you present a hand or, you, and it doesn't have to be step up on a hand either. It can be step up on a perch, you know, whatever, you know, whatever you want to use, whatever you're comfortable with, whatever your bird's comfortable with, but they'll let you know. You know, if you've got a bird that's not willing to step forward, they're going to show you that. And I think that's that's something right. to keep in mind. Right. I have a, a blue-fronted Amazon that I work with, and he has an aversion to hands. Um, so he will step up onto a perch very readily. From a perch, I can get him to move to my forearm. He likes to be on my arm. He likes to be on my shoulder. He has no problem interacting with me. He has no problem touching me. Um, you know, if I touch him with the side of my head, if he bumps against my shoulder, but he still doesn't like hands, whether he's on his cage, whether he's on a table, whether he's on me, he just doesn't like hands. Um, and again, that falls into the, I could slowly work with him through this, but realistically I have the behaviors that I need. He will step up onto the perch. I can move him easily. He'll step down onto my forearm. I can interact with him. I can socialize him. Um, Honestly, he's one of my favorite birds to interact with because he's an older Amazon. Um, so he basically likes to just sit on my shoulder and grumble about things. And so 
especially as 2020 is going on, um, getting to interact with him was a, a great, you know, low budget therapy because I get to just complain about things and you have an Amazon right there going, ar, ar, ar. Um, it was absolutely wonderful. <laughs> There you go. So, so not only did you get him to step up, he'll step up and step down and, but you also got a therapy session that, you know, this is a bargain for you, Jack. I, I like it. Um, and see better living <laughs> your dream. I'm just saying. Um, one of the other things that's really important, I think with this is that it's a comfortable perch. So if the bird's not comfortable with a hand, you've got to make sure it's something that they're comfortable with, because if you, stick something in front of them that may have been used as an aversive at some point that may have been, you know, positive punishment may have been, um, you just don't know what their reaction is going to be to different um, stimuli. So and that perch is, is what we're talking about. And so if you put a perch in front of a bird and there's that immediate step back, then you want to think about um, what you're presenting. Okay. It's gone. Okay. Sorry. I don't know if anybody else was hearing that. It was like um, the ghost of training past or something. I'm not sure. Um, okay. So <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely heard that too. Um, I, I think it'll, it, it'll be gone now. Okay. Wow. Jack has fun stuff. Going on. Is, was that one of the baby birds, Jack? What, are, what kind of birds are you raising? I, I don't know. Yeah, um, I, I I have baby birds playing video games. <laughs> nice. Very nice. <laughs> All right. So step up, step down. Um, small doses. If this is a brand, you know, you bring home a brand new bird, you're not going to be thrusting your hand in front of them going, step up, step up, step up, step up. What, in my opinion, a lot of times new trainers or people who are super excited about training will over cue and with step up that's one of the ones that you've got to kind of wait for okay what are you going to do and observe i mean have you seen that happen jack yeah so i i mean i would say what happens is you basically train your bird to ignore you because you have a bird right in front of you and you're saying step up step up step up step up step up and then it finally will step up so you basically conditioned your bird not only do you need to say step up once and he'll step up, but now it needs to be five times. So your bird's gonna be waiting for that. Um, so it would definitely be something that I would say to be mindful of. Uh, another thing, and this is gonna to apply to all of the training that you're doing, any of these behaviors you're working with, I have found that consistency is going to be your friend when it comes to this. So it, you know, if you had the option, if you could work with an animal one hour session once a week, or if you could work with an animal five minutes a day, you're going to have more success with five minutes a day, even though in the grand scheme of the week, it ends up being less time, but that consistency is going to play to your advantage. You don't want the animal to get bored. You don't want it to get frustrated. So small, easy sessions like that are going to be ideal. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think too, you know, along those lines, not only do they become what we would call bored, but they may become satiated as well. If you're using a, a big reinforcer and, you know, I like to, we talked last time about the, the um, banquet table size chocolate chip cookies. And that if you're giving a whole walnut and then you ask for a behavior again, you're probably not going to get it right away because I'm still busy chewing on that walnut and enjoying that walnut. And I'm not going to do what you're asking. And with the multiple cues, with the step up, step up, step up, step up. Now you've asked for it. You've told them that's what the cue is. It's asking five times, step up, then I will. You have reinforced that after five, I still get something when I step up on that fifth one. So it's something just to keep in mind. It is it's an easy mistake to make because like I said, you're excited about it. You're training something new and then it's, well, how come this isn't, this isn't working. So just something to think about. So where do we go from step up, step down? So does anybody have questions about that, about step up and step down? I probably should ask. <laughs> 
Uh, I mean, step up and step down, I I think, are wonderful because that is usually where people are going to want to start because they want to be able to interact with their bird. They want to be able to pull them out of their cage, bring them over to a play stand. Um, So it's definitely a great behavior to start with. Um, And, you know, it's it's easy. Your bird can pick up on what you want really, really quickly. And so then you have an easy way to have positive interactions with your animal. So that's going to build your relationship. So all of the next things that we're going to talk about will be even easier from there. Right. It's kind of, it's a a progression, I think, is the way we're going to hopefully approach this. So the next one um, we want to talk about is uh, the behavior that's referred to as station. And Adrian mentioned sit, 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 sit with a dog. Absolutely. And I think um, station is the, the bird equivalent of stay. So may, we've got a clip on stationing and maybe we can make them. All right. Once you have a great handle on step up and step down, station training is going to be very, very easy. Basically, it involves just getting your animal to go to a designated place. So in this case, I have a built PVC stand. So Grayson, step down. Awesome. Now the bird knows how to go to there. So uh, Grayson, again, you and Grayson make things look super easy. So for (laughs) me, this behavior is a great way to ensure some safety. If you're with a bird that you're not super, you know, comfortable with, and if they'll station even on their own, not necessarily from a step down, you can get a bird to station and then work around that bird with a little bit more confidence, I think, um, than you might have if you have to be worried, okay, is he coming? Is he coming now? Is he coming? Okay, station and they'll and that avoid some of that. Um, so that you put them on the PVC perch, Jack. Um, did you build yes. that perch? I did. Nice. Uh, <laughs> you you know I love building things out of PVC pipe. And I mean, if anybody would like to learn how to do that themselves, I do have numerous tutorials on building things out of PVC pipe over on the High Red Bird YouTube channel. Um, but it's, PVC it's so your friend. easy. <laughs> I'm not allowed to see any other friends right now, Robin. So I, I have to make do with what I've got. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So is how comfortable or how long did it take Grayson to get what we would refer to as comfortable with that perch? Um, so the the first few times he would step down onto it, he was definitely a little bit wary. He wanted to check that it was stable. He wanted to check that nothing was going to pop out at him. Uh, So this, I think, is another aspect of training that a lot of people don't pay attention to or might forget about. Um, You want to pay attention to what's going on around you. You want to make sure that your timing and everything set yourself up for success in terms of your bird being able to do a behavior. Because if you're trying to, you know, work with your bird, you have two minutes and you're already running late for work and you just need to make something happen and you've got the coffee pot running and you've added a lot of stress to the situation, uh, the bird may not do well with it. Now, Grayson, after he got comfortable with how stable the stand was, um, he it did not take him long to be comfortable just stepping down to it readily. Um, and that's one of the good things about training a stationing behavior because your bird realizes this is a safe space for me. Nothing bad is going to happen. Um, you know, even in something like your your cage, you're going to have toys, which maybe a toy is going to, you know, he'll be swinging on it and the toy will swing back and hit him, which could be potentially negative, potentially scary. Um, a basic station stand doesn't have anything like that. So you can use that to give your bird a safe place when you're having to do scarier things. Um, Uh now I'd say you have to build that incrementally, um, you know, maybe have your bird go to a station once it's comfortable with a station, maybe you can like run a Roomba, um, you know, don't have, you know, dancing camels in the living room, uh, you know, baby steps. Uh, (laughs) you know, I think you, you mentioned more than once ability. And I think 
that's critical if you're when you want to start training a station behavior because what if you have a something that's going to tip over or the bird you know thinks it's going to tip over then that becomes not a place that they're going to want to go to it's you know why would i go there if it's going to tip over and make a loud noise and just be a negative experience so you want to make sure it's a stable perch um it doesn't necessarily have to be freestanding. You can train a station behavior even in the cage itself. Um, I know I've had a lot of people who have issues with um, birds that that are either, they either don't want to come out of their cage or they don't want to go into the cage. And if you put a perch on the door, on the inside of the door, you can use that as a station point. I've done that before. Um, there are some birds that get, you know, super... Um, they'll lunge, they, you know, they'll lunge, they'll bite, whatever that negative thing for you may be um, if you're working around the cage or in the cage. And so if you put a, a, stand, a perch just attached to the inside of the cage door that can, you know, swing open, you can station them there, reinforce that behavior while you're doing other things. Um, so it's, you know, there's a lot of safety comes in. The other thing, Jack, is... Um, is you've got to do it in small doses. You know, small approximations yeah. is the way to go with any of these behaviors because these are pretty basic behaviors. And if you want to start with these and build your way up, you can't kind of create this all or nothing situation. I expect this and you've got to go from point A to Z and, and be successful at it. So how would you break it down? as far as the steps to teaching a station behavior? So the way that I'll usually do it, uh, I'll start with what you saw in the video where it's just a step up or a step down to that stand. It's right next to them. I'll put my hand right next to it. Um, they'll get to stand there for you know a few seconds. I'll get them to step up from the station, reinforce them. They recognize that by staying there, paying attention to me and then coming back when I ask them to, they get reinforced for that. So there's a couple of different ways you can go from there. You can get the bird to stay on the station longer. Um, and that's a enormously beneficial behavior because birds do have a tendency to want to get into mischief. Um, that's probably the nice way to say it. Um, don't tell Santa. Uh, <laughs> you know, they, they can get into a little bit of trouble. So teaching them to stay still, to stay calm, uh, is a useful behavior, but you're not going to build, you know, five to 10 minutes of calm in a single session. Um, the other issue is getting your bird to go to a station. Obviously, I can pick them up and I can, uh, you know, set them down on a station platform like you just saw. But, you know, you can start training them that this is station. This is the cue to go to this particular area. And then you can start working with I'm going to bring you close to it. You can see it. You know you're supposed to go there, but it's not going to be a clear step down. You may have to, you know, do a hop or do a little bit of flight to get to it. And eventually you can shape that behavior to be your station platform is across the room. And I can tell you station and you will fly across the room to go to the perch that you're supposed to go to. Um, but again, all of these things you're going to need to build in small approximations. So what I would say is make sure that your bird is enjoying this interaction with you make sure you are enjoying your interaction with the bird because then you're you're going to want to continue doing this um and another thing when it comes to training i will recommend keeping notes because you are going to have some days where your bird does not do as well um you know you'll be like what my bird pretty much had this perfect yesterday and now he's acting like he doesn't even know me um and that is normal um but by keeping records you'll you'll start to see a pattern you'll start to see that gradual increase as your bird masters that behavior as you shape it to be exactly what you want it to be yeah absolutely and i think that repetition is is so important and jack mentioned earlier the you know five minute sessions Training doesn't have to be a major undertaking that takes over your life. Um, you know, I think it's it's a matter of 
you know, if you can do five minutes every single day to five minutes, 10 minutes, carve out that time. And then that repetition just builds the bird's confidence in that behavior. So they know that, okay, if I go from here to here, if I step down or I fly across the room, whatever you're asking for, they're going to get reinforced for that behavior. Um, Adrian mentioned Adrian cues her birds um, to go into their cage or to go to bed. That's a great um, way to use this behavior. And Julie also said that stationing is a great way to um, acclimate birds to different places. And <coughs> excuse me. And it's so true because if that that perch goes everywhere, I mean, a lot of people, um, a lot of us have done traveling shows or you know, done outreach stuff. And when you go somewhere, there your bird now knows. Okay. I come out of my crate, I'm going to station right there and I'm going to stay there because you've worked, you know, now I've worked to build the, I've worked on station, I've built the duration. Now I'm in a strange place and I'm going to get him to, to uh, stay there. And Adrian also said she used a towel on her hand and her arm because Casper too was afraid of hands when she first got him. There's no right or wrong way. I think Jack and I probably should have said this at the beginning. Um, we can tell you what we've done. We can tell you what's worked for us, but you've got to kind of take it and, and make it your own. Same with like when I talk about enrichment, there's if, if something I say doesn't work for you, then don't use it. If some training technique that we talk about is not something that you feel comfortable doing, then don't do it. So the next step, I think, from station, um, step up, step down to station. So you've graduated station, you've, you've moved it around, you've generalized it into different locations. So the next step, and it's not even really another step, it's kind of just a use for station, is scale training. So I think we've got a video on scale training. Now scale training is going to be very, very easy, especially if your bird is already station trained to a particular perch. So all you're going to need is you're going to need your scale. You're going to need your perch. We are going to use this as a stand. Um, so that's gonna go right there. And then Grayson, step down. There you go. We can get a weight on that bird very, very easily. It's such a great, it's a great behavior and it's so important too. I mean, I wonder how many people who are listening do weight, get weights on their birds on a regular basis. How often do you get weights on the birds at the farm, Jack? So we will get weights on the birds at the farm at least monthly. Um, and depending on the bird, we may need to get them more often than that. Um, now I've been showing you guys how I'm hand raising the baby birds, the ones that are in the other room, uh, where they, they are reasonably behaving, um, on those birds, I'm getting their weights daily. Um, when they were even younger, when they were hand feeding every two hours, I was getting weight on them every two hours. Um, so, you know, there, there's going to be different times that you're going to get those weights. Uh, it is going to depend on your situation. But ideally, if your bird is scale trained, you saw there is nothing that goes into it. Like it's a step up, it's a step down. Uh, yeah. The reason we say station training should happen first is because adding the scale to the mix, like we said before, is one level of, you know, more intensity. It's a little bit scarier because not only am I on a platform, but there's, you know, the, the reader for the scale right next to me. That could be a little bit scary for a bird. But as you saw, Grace, I mean, I think we're going to have to cut Grayson a check at the end of this session because he is uh, working pretty hard. Um, but he showed you just how easily it goes. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Maybe Santa will send Grayson a toy. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> Santa knows some elves. You could maybe shoot one Grayson's way. Um, so wait. It's so important to get weights on your birds. You know, everybody's like, oh, but that's just, you know, um, if you're a breeder or that's just if you've got a sick bird. Um, yeah, Alicia, a scale, like add that to your toolbox. It's so important. And I, I mean, you can make it part of the morning routine. You know, I know everybody does the wake up, good morning kind of thing with their birds. 
if you take your bird out first thing in the morning, get a weight on it. It's not a big deal because it's a great way to see if there's something physically going on with your bird. Well, and I think like what you were saying that, you know, a lot of people think of you only want to get weights on your birds when they're sick. Uh, sometimes the weight is how you find out that your bird is sick because you want to remember birds are prey animals. They want to try to hide every sign of illness or injury. Um, and I actually have an anecdote that is perfectly applicable to this. Uh, Mika, who you guys saw last week, uh, Mika just had... Uh, a mild fungal infection. He was eating normally. His fecals were normal. His attitude was normal. Uh, but we found out there was a problem because in between his weights, he had dropped about 80 grams, which wasn't normal. Uh, so we were able to, to figure that out. Um, and he's obviously perfectly healthy now. Um, but so getting that weight, it's not just a matter of treating a sick bird. Sometimes that is how you find out that a bird is sick. If your bird is actively showing signs of illness, sometimes that can be too late. So if you can get that weight, if you can catch something before it becomes an issue, uh, you're gonna be much better prepared to take care of your animal. Absolutely, and I think, you know, it's, it's, it can be subtle and you don't even notice it. It's not like you're looking at your bird and going, wow, he looks kind of thin today. I mean, it can be a subtle weight change. And then if you keep, you keep watching that it, and it, if there's a significant change, you call the vet. I mean, it's not going to hurt to do that. Um, and your vet is best to advise you, you know, if that's, if you need to go in or not. And I think it's again, basic behavior that has huge ramifications you know, it really makes a big, big difference in the well-being of your bird. So, all right. So we've mastered step up, step down. We've mastered station. We've mastered scale. Um, and if you've got a scale and it makes all kinds of bells and whistles, I can tell you, if you can turn those off, that's the way to go. Because it's just, you know, it's, it's not a good idea. Right. And the other thing I would say for a bird, if you are picking out a scale, it, I mean, it's going to depend on the size of your bird. Obviously, you saw that scale that we were using. Uh, Grayson's bigger bird. It's a bigger scale. When I've shown you guys uh, the raising of those green cheek conures, smaller bird, smaller scale. Uh, the one recommendation I can have, make sure that you get a scale that can measure accurately in grams. Uh, grams is how you're going to want to measure your bird because birds do not weigh that much. Um, even if they look pretty big, uh, remember they're built for flight. They're built to be really lightweight. So grams is going to give you a much more accurate measurement for their weight. Absolutely. And Karen brings up a good point. She said she weighs weekly. If you have an older bird or bird that's convalescing, uh, this is a big one, a bird that you're converting to a better diet you should weigh more frequently. Um, and you wanna weigh at a consistent time of day if that's possible. It's the same, come on, yes. you know, when, when you go to Weight Watchers, they, they weigh at a certain time, you know, you, the meeting's at the same time every week, or it used to be when we could all go to real places. Um, but <laughs> it's the same thing, Karen. Um, and, you know, I think it's important to remember that, again, the subtleties with our birds are, are just, it's about observation. It's about, you know, we've taken this responsibility on. So now we need to, to be, we need to take care of it. We need to watch those little kind of things that happen that may be a huge red flag down the road. Okay. So scale training, we've got, we've got the, look at this. If, if only it were this quick, I will tell you, um, I have a friend, Andy Hall, who is a bird trainer or, and I was looking at YouTube's today and he um, did one about um, scale training. And he said it took two 15 minute sessions. Our birds are smart. You know, it's really, I, I would suggest, you know, maybe a little bit longer than that, but it's definitely that repetition. And don't expect, this is a big one that happens um, with new trainers is you get this behavior and you're like, yes, I got them scale trained. This is awesome. And then you don't do it for like a month. 
uh, oops. And then you just can't understand why he's not doing it anymore. So they're smart, but you've got to be, you've got to keep working on it. You've got it. Training never goes away. There's no such thing as, oh, I trained that behavior and it's good forever. Not how it works. Jack, have you ever had a forever, a forever behavior? I have not. Um, I have found that using the, the behaviors that you train uh, in rotation uh, is going to be in the best interest of your bird, in the best interest of you, because both of you, both you and your bird, have the potential of getting bored. Um, so when you're working with behaviors like that, things like scale training, don't just scale train when you think you need to, like station train your bird at different times, um, station train in different orders. So if your bird gets very used to you pick me up and then you give me a little bit of attention and then you station train me, they're going to get built into that routine. So you can change things up and stimulate them mentally by, you know, having them step up, go to the station, and then they get that little bit of attention. Uh, just mm -hmm. that little bit of a change in the routine can make a difference in the training of your bird. Absolutely. And I think too, it's again, let's go back to that word subtlety, that when you're giving a cue, dependent on what, if it's not a verbal cue, if you're not doing that behavior over and over again and working on the training, you may, for lack of a better term, screw up the cue. So it's, you know, if it's always good job and the next time you do it because you haven't done it for a while, you go, good boy. Well, okay. Those do not necessarily mean the same thing. They're not, if your bird has been, has been trained that that's the cue, that, you know, or the reinforcer is good bird or good job, whatever it is, you've got to kind of stick with that. And if you want to change that, um, then that's a process as well. And if you're using hand signals, you want to make sure that you're consistent with your hand signal that because you're having a crummy day, if this is the cue and then it's you're feeling kind of eh because, you know, it's blah out and you go completely different cue. Right. Um, no. And that so that's part of why people will establish a bridge. They'll use something like a clicker or a whistle to reinforce their bird because you can't accidentally make a click sound. Uh, you can't accidentally make that whistle chirp. But if you're not thinking about it and your bird is reinforced with good bird, you can accidentally say good bird. Uh, and maybe your bird didn't do something that merits reinforcing. Maybe it, you know, did the bird just poop and you have, you know, accidentally said good bird. And now the bird is thinking, well, I'm supposed to poop on you all the time. Uh, you know, if the bird just shifted his weight, you know, did you accidentally reinforce that? So it's it's a constant uh, bit of work that you're going to have to put in there. Mm -hmm. So Karen says the only behavior they seem to remember for eternity is bad language. <gasps> Where would they have learned that, Karen? It's got to be a rehomed bird. <laughs> about it can't possibly be one of karen's birds so all right so we've got step up <laughs> step down, we've got station we've got scale we're moving on to crate training now one of the most useful behaviors for your bird is going to be crate training if you have a travel carrier for your bird in this case i have a custom built wire carrier made just for grayson it's a good idea to get them used to going in and out of the travel carrier. You don't just want to use this behavior when you are going somewhere, but instead work it into your regular training program. Grayson, step up. Good bird. All right, Grayson. Step down. Good bird. Look at how easy that is. And yet again, life was easy. It's all, it's rainbows and unicorns at the farm with Jack. This is wonderful. Um, so, so I have a, a fun story tied to that clip though. Um, but it does yeah. sort of reveal what we're working on. 
Um, so you may have noticed that in that clip, I was a little bit out of breath. Um, they were currently cleaning some things at another area of the farm. Um, and it was, it, we just had a cold front come through. It was a lightly windy day. Um, there was a mostly deflated balloon that was in a trash can that the wind caught and flew over us. Grayson had a minor meltdown about it. I had to run over, get it off the fence so that it wouldn't scare him. As you can see in the clip, we immediately went back to working and he was used to it. He was comfortable. Um, so it worked really, really well. Um, but yeah, I didn't realize until I listened to it here. Yeah, I was a little bit out of breath. <laughs> no, no. I, I thought you were just so excited about, about what you were doing. Um, <laughs> So crate training is, is one of those things that if you can, let me ask you this first, Jack, actually, let me backtrack. Do you actually have to verbally give the cue to Grayson or is he trained? Cause it looks to me a little bit in those clips, like if you just put, present your hand, he will step up and step down. And, and that is the point that he has gotten to. Um, he mm -hmm. did not start off that way. Um, so we used the physical presentation of a hand and the verbal cue step up, basically to just give the bird as much information as possible. But you can shape the behavior to the point that you just need the physical cue, that presentation of your hand. Uh, I don't know if you could see, there's a couple of clips where Grayson sees me stepping towards him with my arm raised and his foot is already up, ready to go. Um, so again, that's just going to be part of your... Uh, working that into your training program, shaping those behaviors to be exactly what you want them to be. Uh, and I think it's like what you said earlier, that there is no, you know, this is the only way to do this. If you want your bird to only respond to the verbal cue of step up, and that's when they step up, you can train that behavior that way. If you want to shape the behavior so that your bird eventually does it just by the presentation of your hand, you can shape it that way too. It's your bird. It's your relationship with that animal. You're the trainer here. You can shape those behaviors to be what is most useful for you. So I know we talk a lot with giving our animals enrichment and things like that, thinking about a goal-based approach, but mm -hmm. the same is going to be applicable here. Think about what it is you ultimately want to get and shape your behaviors to be that. Absolutely. And I, and I think that's the thing is if you want to get from point A to point B, you need to know what is your ultimate goal for point B. Um, Bev, your birds train you. A lot of birds train a lot of humans. It's so very true. Um, you know, but it's nice that your bird tells you good job. It's, I, you got to have that in your life. It's very important. Um, with the crate training, I think it's really important to kind of introduce them to the crate so that it's something that's not just there when it's time to go to the vet or when it's time to, you know, evacuate in an emergency. That crate should be kind of like a part of, again, the routine. The more often you do it, the more often you use it, it's not going to be this, you know, the feet go up and the, you know, they take that raptor coming in for a landing stance um, or the wings come out so they're way bigger than the door. Um, so if you've got that crate and you can use it, and if it's something that, you know, maybe you just leave it out and see, maybe your bird will approach it. Maybe, you know, these guys obviously look at them. They're just kind of hanging out. It's not, nobody's slamming the door in their face. Nobody's, you know, saying you've got to stay in there. And I think that's an important part about crate training. Crate training should not be, well, from, in my opinion, anyway, crate training should not be your bird goes in the first time and you shut the door and you leave them in there for 20 minutes because that, you know, I'm not going to probably do that again. If somebody, if I go into a room, somebody shuts the door and doesn't let me out. I'm not going to do that again for a while. Unless of course, you know, there's cocktails or something good in there. And then that's another story, but, um, but in and out well, is a great way to do it. Um, I think you hit on an interesting point there. You know, if there is something really worthwhile in there, uh, you know, that can lessen the inhibition of the animal to want to participate in that behavior. Crate training is one of those behaviors where an animal 
can be a little bit more intimidated, you know, depending on the build of your crate. Uh, the one that I showed you guys in the video I built, it's all wire, the bird can see out all the time, but a lot of people will use something like a plastic dog carrier, which doesn't have the same visibility. It can be a little bit scary. Uh, now, as far as I'm concerned, as a trainer, um, bribery can work in this situation to get an animal interested in that carrier. Um, now, like you were saying, Robin, I would, you know, get the animal to go in and as soon as it goes in and it's comfortable, I would reinforce it by bringing it out and we can continue that behavior. And eventually you don't need to bribe the animal to do that because again, just like you don't want it to be negative when they go in their crate, you don't want to have to resort to bribery every single time. But it is definitely one of the tools in the toolbox that you can use to start shaping that behavior. Absolutely. And you can look at this crate um, that's on screen now with if there are the slats in the back. And if you're using a crate that is more enclosed than open, um, you can get them. You can sometimes, you know, if you offer a reinforcer from the outside in. So if the bird goes in, goes all the way through to the back of the crate, you reinforce at the back of the crate. Um, initially, you're going to reinforce just for putting a foot up on the lip of that crate. It's got to be those small approximations. It's not about, I went right in the crate and I stood in there and just waited. That's that's not going to, ha well, it might happen with some birds, but probably not. So, you know, the first step is that one foot goes up on the door and then, okay, I leaned in a little bit. I'm going to reinforce for that. Okay, I've leaned in and I put the other foot up. I'm going to reinforce for that. Now I've actually walked to the back of the crate. I'm going to reinforce for that. So you take it in those small steps um, and it, it really, really makes a difference. And I, Bev says she can't get them to come out of the cages for her. It's a bloodbath to entice them out. Once they're out, it's easier, but they will not come out if I want them to. Okay. So Bev, I don't know when, if you were on from the very beginning, um, when I was talking about the perch on the door, this is a great way to avoid the bloodbath. So if you, with the door closed, you reinforce them for stationing on that perch. So now there's no, there's no blood involved, no loss of skin. Um, and so if you just keep, you know, reinforcing while they're standing there on the perch inside, and then you slowly open it up a little bit, open it up, open it up, open it up, reinforce for stationing on that, that perch. And then they may decide to, I don't know if where you're trying to get them to go, whether it's trying to get them to go to a play stand or, you know, to a different location. So reinforce as they move towards that and not toward your fingers or face. So. Right. And go ahead, the approximations that the approximations that you're going to need to use are going to be completely dependent on you, your bird, and your situation. So, you know, some birds may be able to immediately jump to, uh, you know, I come out of my cage, I go directly into the carrier, and vice versa. And your bird may not do that. And that is okay. You need to develop your training plan with your individual animal in mind. Mm -hmm. And and I think, you know, I, I feel like we just keep repeating stuff, but it's because the points are, are they're, they're important points. It's about observation. It's about, I'm watching this bird. This bird is exhibiting what I define as comfortable behavior, whether it's a rouse, whether it's, you know, um, the feathers aren't all slicked back. The, you know, the bird's not lunging. The bird's you you know what comfortable what you define as comfortable is and so you got to watch you've got to observe for those and the subtlest you know nuances that happen you need to be aware of of when they're happening so that you can reinforce that moment and like jack said it may not be your bird goes in and out and you know I, diane says here that she tells cody he's a good boy while she slowly closes the door so it's not you know she's not slamming the door she's like taking her time and that's the other thing too. We keep in mind they're prey animals. Fast movements, not so much. It's not going to help in your training process or your progress. Um, so, it, and it doesn't look the same for for any bird. You can't. 
that would be like saying, okay, so I worked in this aviary with, you know, I, I had a colleague who had 800 scarlet macaws. It was a breeding program for scarlet macaws in Mexico. And he had 800. And I remember the first time he told me that because I was all like excited about, oh, I could come down and help you enrich their lives. And I said, so how many do you have? And he said, 800 macaws. And I went, 800? Um, and yes, they did indeed. It was, it was a breeding program for conservation and, and you know, for this facility. But uh, so it's about, you know, taking things step by step by step. I guarantee you that Fernando does not have the same training plan for every single one of those scarlet macaws. It's, it's different. And we talk about a study of one um, and it's really, really, you know, individualized. I mean, do you train Grayson and Mika the same? Absolutely not. Um, they are completely different birds. They have completely different personalities. They have, um, it, it, you know, I know we try not to anthropomorphize our animals, but it's sometimes helpful for people to think of it in terms of people. When you are interacting with different people in your life, if we get to do that again at some point, uh, you don't use the same approach for everyone. Um, you know, like some people you give a lot of, you know, positive interaction and they need cuddles and they need hand holding. and some bird or some people you just, you tell them what you would expect from them and they do that. Um, you know, bir birds are going to be the exact same way. Uh, some of them are going to need smaller approximation. They are going to need those behaviors shaped so much easier. Uh, Grayson is one of those birds that the reason I can show you all these different things like this, um, his natural personality is, what do you want me to do? I'm going to do it. What next? Um, and it's great. And that's not Mika's personality. And, uh, you know, birds all have different personalities. And just because your bird doesn't have any one particular personality, it doesn't mean you're not going to be able to train them. It doesn't mean you're not going to be able to master these behaviors. Your approach to getting there is just going to be different. Right. And I think that's on us, you know. So this is is um, from Hari, the Hagen Avicultural Research Institute. And this bird is being toweled. So toweling can be a really uncomfortable behavior. It can if you use it only when it's an emergency, it's it's similar to the crate. It becomes the big giant towel is now coming over me. So again, think about a, a prey animal. Things do approach from above, um, you know, birds of prey, not prey animals. Birds of prey approach from above and it's this shadow that comes over you. So now I've got my bird and I'm going to put this towel over him and that's just not going to be a pleasant experience for anybody. I'm probably going to get bitten even through the towel. Um, so one of the things that, that they work on at Hari is that their birds are comfortable from a very young age with a towel. And I think this is one of those things where you're building your relationship. You're working on, on how am I going to get this, this to be positive and you make it kind of a game. So it's, and you can do the same with the crate you know, it's the in and out and it's the, the under the towel and, and not under the towel. It's the, you know, crawl through. The other thing, a really cool crate is the one that has doors on both ends so they can walk straight through. I mean, if you can get one of those, that's a wonderful alternative. But Jack, when you've, you're, in your experience is training um, towel behaviors, how, you know, how does that, do you, do you towel the birds at the farm? So one thing I will say right now is, you know, there are some people who are averse to toweling because they, they don't like it. They think it's scary. They think it's mean to the bird. Uh, what I can tell you right now is if there is ever a medical emergency with your bird, they will be toweled. The vet is going to have to do that in order to safely observe them, in order to safely do what they can to fix your bird because um, the vet doesn't want to get bit. Um, and especially if a bird is injured or scared, it is going to be more likely to bite. Um, so to me, training toweling is the 
far more desirable option. Um, now, I have been on the YouTube channel, I've been showing you guys how I've been raising uh, that set of green cheek Conyers. We are already working on behaviors like that. So things like step up, just going from one finger to the next as they, you know, step up, step up, step up. Um, they're getting good at that. Um, but we are also starting to practice things like restraint. Um, one of my favorite games that I uh, like to play um, is squish the bird, um, where it's basically I'll have the bird on something like a table and, you know, like you pet the bird and there's like a little bit of restraint, a little bit of pressure. Um, and once the bird is comfortable with that, with you interacting with it like that, then you can try something like uh, a single sheet of paper towel, obviously something that's not big and intimidating. Uh, you know, it can touch your bird. You, they can touch it with their foot first. They can realize it's not scary. Um, it can touch them on their side first. Uh, because like you said, you want to avoid big giant towel coming down from above to grab them um, because that's really scary. But if you slowly build that and you make it a fun, positive uh, interaction, a game, uh, then your bird's going to really enjoy that because then toweling is not this scary thing that might be out to get them. Instead, it's a fun game that they play with their person. And, it, you know, and it's there, there's a lot of work going on now with um, fear free vetting. And I know that Dr. Alicia McLaughlin um, from out on the West Coast is doing a lot of work with Barb Heidenreich on fear free vetting. And I know that that, it, you know, in a perfect world, every veterinarian would be able to handle an exotic bird. Um, that's not necessarily true. And, you know, Melissa here says that, you know, her bird's not a fan, but he does he plays and stuff sometimes, but doesn't want to be in one. And unfortunately, there are situations where there aren't any other alternatives. And so if you've got a bird that's willing to like play and surf like Zorro on it, and they go to the vets and they at least have some knowledge of what that is, then it can be a more positive experience. Um, yeah, not flooding, teaching inadvertently with affection. You know, it's definitely not flooding. We don't want to do the all at once. I've told the story before of when I brought my Kayik to the vet and I turned to get something out of my pocketbook and I turned back. Well, I hadn't turned back yet. And I heard the Kayik scream of death. You know, the one, you know, that one that, that, mm. um, and so, and I'm like, what? and I turn around and the vet had toweled Nikki and Nikki had never been in a towel before. It was the very first time, and, you know, unless it was, you know, with the breeder when he was much, much younger. And I just was, you know, I'm like, did, did you, why did you do that? Well, because I need to get a blood draw. Well, why do you need to get a blood draw? Well, just for a baseline. I'm like, yeah, no, 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 no. We're, we're not going there. We're going to work up to this. We're going to work on towel. We're going to work on injection, you know, or blood draws. And then we're going to go from there. But my bird was that that towel was something that he had never experienced. And so it, it, you really have to make sure it's just something that they're at least familiar with, that they've at least seen in a non-threatening manner. So we've, we've covered a ton tonight and Jack and I had big plans. We were going to go even further with this. We were going to go to <laughs> you know, syringe training and all kinds of targeting. And so I think we're going to have to do that another night, another Friday session. Um, but there's a couple of things that I wanted to talk about. Well, first of all, I have a trivia question and this will get you a leather elves t-shirt and a discount code, I will private message you the code for 15% off your next Leather Elves purchase. So Jack and I have been throwing around some technical terms and there is a book that is pretty much like the Bible for animal trainers and a lot of this information comes from it. And if you don't have it and you wanna delve further into training, I would suggest getting it. Does anybody know what the title of that book is? Do, 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 do. See, they make me sing every week, Jack. Do, do, <laughs> no, literally nobody makes you sing. Oh, come on. <laughs> they love hearing me sing. Look, no one's answering because they want me to sing. No? Oh, name that book. Come on, you guys can do it. <laughs> 
All right. How about if I give you, I mean, I could give you the author. I know some of you know this. I was on, this book is essentially the gold standard for uh, tr animal training. Um, it is. No. It, it, it. Not Thorndike. Okay, so the author is Karen Pryor. Does that help? <laughs> well, clearly you guys have other well, choices. Right? <laughs> um, well, and it, like as they're trying to think of the title, because I know there is a little bit of a delay between uh, us broadcasting and them being able to comment. Um, you know, I, I think it's important to let people know that, yes, we are still looking at doing uh, all of those other training behaviors as well. Things like that syringe training, that target training. Uh, so if there is a particular behavior you would like to see us talk about, um, go ahead, send us a message. Just let us know uh, if there is. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> I was very Karen Anderson, don't shoot the dog. Nice job. Alicia Goodbird is a great reference. There's don't shoot the dog. Um, and I guarantee you, Melissa, that Dana does have don't shoot the dog. If not from right now, then from many, many years ago. And Adrian came up with don't shoot the dog too. Um, Alicia, back to um, real quickly, Good Bird is another great uh, resource. And I know that Barbara is also doing a lot of, um, she's kind of changing the philosophy of how she does training. And so that's something to kind of keep your eye on. So one other, a couple of other things. Last week, we talked a little bit about Ray Varela. Um, and Ray is doing some fantastic work, uh, roasting coffee and he, the, it's wild macaw coffee and you can find it at facebook.com, um, forward slash Raymond Barella dot seven. And see, he actually roasts the beans. It's super cool. And part of your, so not only do you get the life saving, giving elixir coffee, but you get to do some work on conservation from a cause too. So check out Ray's Facebook page for that. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to talk to you guys about was, oh, we, what is that, Jack? So I actually have um, a brand new shirt available in uh, my Threadless store. Um, so that's going to be highredbird.threadless.com. Um, I've been coming up with fun things just because who doesn't need more fun bird themed thing. So I'm actually wearing one of the shirts right now. It's the, sorry, I'm late. I have birds. Um, but the new one is uh, based on an Instagram post that I put up that everyone seemed to love. Uh, it's a rose-breasted cockatoo. He was sitting on a perch and he had a uh, condiment cup filled with mixed seeds. And um, in the style of a jingle that I'm not going to try to sing because uh, one, I cannot sing, and two, I do not wish to get sued. Uh, you know, the, the oh, caption oh, is oh, the best oh, part oh. of waking up. <laughs> Thank you, Santa. Uh, the best part of waking up is mixed seeds in your cup. Uh, so that is available over on the Threadless store, and you can get that in shirts, sweatshirts, tote bags, uh, etc. So, and all of the purchases in the Threadless store uh, just support me getting the materials and other things to put together more tutorials and everything over on the YouTube channel. So you guys can check that out if you want. Very cool. I like that. And I think if Diane's still on, I'm not sure if she is. Um, Diane was all excited about the Goffin uh, and like pointed it out to Frank. So if Frank's watching, <laughs> there's that Goffin for you. Um, and there's a lot of other good references that people are posting and we can, you know, I would suggest going through the comments and looking at some of the, you know, Ken Ramirez's new book, um, The Perfectly Trained Parrot. There's a lot of different ones out there. And I think it's just a matter of taking all of that, all those different books and assimilating them into a style for yourself. You know, I think that that's really, really important to do. Um, so one other thing, we have a promotion through Leather, Leather Elves. Um, it's called Be a Rockstar. 
So what you can do is you can donate an all-star to toy box to parrots in need. Uh, if you go to the Leather Elves site, there's um, a section that's the Rockstar section, and you can cho choose different levels. It's like vinyl, Grammy, platinum, gold, and then there's a list of toys. You can choose size, small, medium, and large, and then you can choose the rescue of your choice um, to have us send that to. So it's just a way to go back to some, some parrots that are in rescues. Rescues are doing amazing work. So it's kind of just a cool way to give back a little bit. So Jack, do you have anything else? I mean, I, I, I think we've covered uh, a ton of different uh, topics. So I think the important thing for people to remember here is one, you can do this. Uh, you know, it might seem a little bit intimidating, especially if you've never trained an animal before, but you are definitely capable of accomplishing this. Figure out what your goals are going to be and just make sure that you are setting small approximations. Your bird isn't going to automatically jump to having fully shaped behaviors. Um, yeah. So figure out what you need to do to make that happen. I think, you know, and I think it's true. We titled it Better Living Through Training. And it's a great way to engage with your bird. So if you're having a hard time figuring out, well, what am I going to do with, them? what am I, how do I, you know, other than snuggling, which uh, we don't want the snuggling happening. So what can we do instead? Do a training session. It's time spent with your bird. It's time spent not on the couch eating ice cream, you, not your bird. Um, so it just, it's another way to keep yourself active, to keep your bird active. And you can train a lot of different behaviors. These are a stepping off point. These are a place to start. And when you look at these behaviors and you break them down, um, you can apply them to other things. And I think, you know, it's just a really, really great way for you to have some success with your bird, for your bird to be successful at what you're asking. And, and it's just kind of a win-win situation. So we want to thank you guys again. Um, Jack and I have kind of decided that we're going to keep doing this conversation style if it works for you guys. And we've both got different experience over the years. I have a lot more years, but we've, we've got some, some different perspectives we can give you guys. And if you think of things you want us to talk about, feel free to message us, drop a comment, um, you know, whatever that, that looks like for you. So I think next week, we're going to talk a little bit about holiday hazards. I know the holidays are looking different, um, but I think it's those those hazards are still out there. And I think we can take some of the stuff we talked about tonight and apply it to the holiday hazard situations. So I want to say have a great week. Um, okay, I'm going to do a little bit of a plug. If you guys are interested in any Christmas toys, the elves are getting ready to go on vacation back to the North Pole, although we're getting like eight inches of snow tomorrow, so they'll probably stay here. I don't know. Um, but if you're looking for Christmas stuff, stop on over to the Leather Elves and those shirts that Jack's got make wonderful Christmas gifts and holiday gifts. So um, we will see you guys hopefully next week. And thank you again. Um, you guys make it fun with all your comments and questions. So take care. Have a good week. I do need to say thank you to my Patreon patrons for helping to make these videos possible. You can find out more by visiting High Red Bird on Patreon or clicking the link in the description section down below if you would like more information. Thanks! Mm -hmm.